Good morning. How's everybody doing this week? Uh, could be better. Yeah, until I got some bad news this morning. Uh oh. Something all the time that the devil has really been behind me, but I tell you what, he's gone. I guess that's something you want to keep unspoken this morning. But, uh, anyhow, at 8 o'clock this morning, my stepmother, she called her son's wife. I didn't know much about his wife, but him I did. And uh, they took her to do uh, renting over the weekend or something. And she was bleeding in her stomach. And up there at Duke, they done some surgery on her. And I don't know all the details, and I don't know what it was coming from. So anyhow, she called my stepmother coming this morning and told me that she passed away. Oh no! And what's her name? I'm so sorry, but I have no idea. That's okay. But no, I think her name was Rhonda or Wanda, and just keep the family in prayer mm. and it's something all the time. Definitely. Every day. What else is on your hearts this morning? Praises or prayer requests? I have a request for my granddaughter having her thyroid and pyrothyroid, if that's how you say it, mm -hmm. um, removed that this morning. Uh, oh. My phone goes off because they let me know she got through the surgery. All right. I'm oh. just thankful. I was looking through some drawers this morning mm -hmm. and I found my papers when I went to gig years ago. Mm -hmm. I was allergic to everything. And God gave me a gift, apple cider vinegar. Hmm. Now that is the truth. That's helped you with a lot of those issues that and you were having years and years ago. Now the only thing I'm really allergic to is smoke and perfume. Cigarette smoke and perfume. Well that has definitely been a blessing you know, for your life. see the things that I was allergic to. I mean, I was bad. I was just bad. Usually that's what they do. They take like a tablespoon of it. Okay. I took shots mm -hmm. years. All right. Dan? Just keep me in prayer. That, that we can do. My heart. He does. It's the holidays coming, so. It's going to be a tough time these next heart. several weeks. So, just that I can... Go over that hill. That's it. That's it. A lot of emotions as we move to Thanksgiving next week and then Christmas and That's just over hardest. a month. And That's the hardest. We're just so praying nice. for our, our denomination churches. Absolutely. We're that people will come back and we just need the people back in the church. That's and, it. I mean, we've had COVID. Yeah. We're praying that. It's gotten better, and then it got worse, and then it kind of got better again. That's a slight uptick the last few days, but. Oh, just we heard on our news that people in the nursing home, yeah, it's about five people had already had all the shots, and every one of them died from it. Hmm. Wow. So every one of them had it and died. I'm concerned about the attendance because too many say they enjoy going to church in their pajamas. They do. That's and that's gotten to be the case for right. many people that I've heard from. That's what I was talking about our, to our preacher yesterday. Said, Absolutely. You might need to stop broadcasting it. But you hate for those that truly that are truly invalids. Need it. But there's got to be some way to grasp the people. They can go and the thing at is, home, young to couples are not coming back in See, we have a, if the church that had young school children. And church. And they can like, sit at home with a cup of coffee you know, and their pajamas or whatever. Mm -hmm. it's, it's very, very sad when you, you have coming. all those classrooms and you just walk by. I know the feeling. Uh, it's sad. I definitely understand. Yeah, and it's got to be something we can do. I mean, we pray about it, mm -hmm. and um, it's just a true concern yeah. in Absolutely. our hearts. <laughs> It's a lot that's going on. That it is. I mean, much in our world. I try to hold as much as I can through faith. That's what faith we do. is the key word. That's what gives us the hope we need to keep pushing forward, even in times such as these. 
Yeah. Oh no, I'll, I'll give you that. I'll, I'll put that on the cutting board when we go next door. People staying home in their pajamas. Then we have one man that comes and does, and he's he's not had a severe stroke, but he's had some, and he walks with a cane. Mm-hmm. Like I was talking about, Fred just I said, if that man can get to church on Sunday morning, there ain't no reason that Absolutely. some young folks and in better health people can't get to church on Sunday morning. That's right. Mm-hmm. Water, water, it's a lot there. Yeah. The truth, is, they always say the truth is the truth is the light of the world. That's it. Have you ever heard of that one? And then some people embrace the truth, and some people, it's kind of like we looked at in Galatians last week. When you do bring up the truth, then people start getting offended and turned away. That's a lot. It is. And all we can do is just pray and pray and pray because, you know, it's just a lot going on. Hmm. Maybe you have unspoken needs that are close to your hearts this morning. Let's take a few moments as we collect our hearts and our minds, get ready for our study, and then I'll lead us in a moment of prayer. So would you bow with me? Heavenly Father, we are so truly thankful for the blessing of this day, the opportunity that we have to assemble once again is your gift to us as we start this Wednesday. Father, I thank you for those individuals who are here in person, those who will come tonight, those who will view this service a little bit later on in the day or the days to come. I ask a special blessing upon each and every one of them. May their hearts and minds be open and receptive to the things of your word. May we all learn. May we all grow deeper and closer to you so that we might be better witnesses and better servants for your kingdom. Lord, we stop and we say thank you for so many blessings, for how good you are to us day in and day out, the strength that you've given us in days past, the hope that we have for tomorrow. Lord, what a wonderful life it is that we live through Christ. Lord, we know that this world does have its challenges, and we know that it would certainly be so much more overwhelming if we did not have your power and presence working in and through our lives. Lord, today when we think about your blessings, that gives us so much confidence when we approach you in prayer, when we have needs that are pressing on our hearts and our minds. We know of so many who are hurting, who are hurting physically and mentally, emotionally, spiritually. With the holidays upon us, there are going to be a lot of different emotions for so many in our church family and community. Lord, we know that The world, as we've said before in our discussions, is not the place that we wish for it to be. But we know that it continues to be our mission field and that we still have a good work to do day in and day out. Lord, give us the guidance, the wisdom, the strength, the encouragement we need each and every day to be faithful servants of your word, to be the light and the salt that you would have us to be so that other people will see the reality of the gospel of Jesus, so that they'll know that it's something truthful, something that they can believe in, and something they can live according to that will transform their lives forever and ever. Lord, again, we thank you for these moments together. Let us be receptive for what you have in store for us And for these and all good gifts, we stop and we say thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right, Galatians chapter 4. We're going to put chapter 4 to bed today, I promise. I was going to put it to bed last week, but then we didn't get through 20 verses two weeks ago. But that was a good thing because there was a lot of material that we had to wade through in those first 20 verses. So today we're going to pick up with Galatians chapter 4 at verse 21, and this will take us through the end of the chapter at verse 31. Of course, next week we're going to take a break due to preparations for Thanksgiving, but we'll be back in two weeks, and we're going to finish up Galatians prior to Christmas, and we're going to have just a little window of break in there for the holidays, and we're going to come back in the new year in a study of Nehemiah. Old Testament book, wonderful book, 
It's about 13 chapters long. It's the story of God's people as they're regathering, regrouping, and rebuilding following the time of Babylonian captivity. It's a story of a man and his leadership. It's a story of one man's heart that is broken because of what he sees going on amongst the people even after they're able to go back to their homeland and back to the city of Jerusalem. It's a story of rediscovering who God is and also being able to rebuild in light of that rediscovery. So I hope that you'll help us to get the word around. It's going to be a wonderful study, not only because it's a biblical book and it's an Old Testament biblical book, which it's been a little while since we've been in the Old Testament, but also because it is such a great story and I believe it's applicable to the times in which we're living. It gives us some hope and some encouragement to get up, to move forward, to continue the good work that God has called us into. Galatians chapter 4, beginning at 21. I'm going to read this whole section to us, and then we're going to go back and unpack it just a little bit, because it can be, as we've seen with Paul in Galatians, a tiny bit confusing the way he jumps around. Tell me, you who desire to be subject to the law, will you not listen to the law? For it is written that Abraham had two sons, one by a slave woman, the other by a free woman. One, the child of the slave, was born according to the flesh. The other, the child of the free woman, was born through the promise. Now this is an allegory. These women are two covenants. One woman, in fact, is Hagar from Mount Sinai, bearing children from slavery. Now Hagar is Mount Sinai in Arabia and corresponds to the present Jerusalem, for she is in slavery with her children. But the other woman corresponds to the Jerusalem above, she is free, and she is our mother. For it is written, Rejoice, you childless one, you who bear no children. Burst into song and shout, you who endure no birth pangs. For the children of the desolate woman are more numerous than the children of the one who is married. Now you, my friends, are children of the promise, like Isaac. But just as at that time the child who was born according to the flesh persecuted the child who was born according to the Spirit, so it is now also. But what does the Scripture say? Drive out the slave and her child, for the child of the slave will not share in the inheritance with the child of the free woman. So then, friends, we are children, not of the slave, but of the free woman. Did you get all that? It's a lot in just ten verses or so. Let's go back. This is going to take some time to think back on our study of Genesis. We were in this text over two years ago, going on probably two and a half years ago. But a lot of what Paul is speaking about here is taken from a couple of chapters in Genesis. One being Genesis chapter 16 and the other being Genesis chapter 21. Real quick, let's lay out who our key players are in this part of the story. We know Abraham. Abraham has been a part of Paul's argument in the Galatians correspondence for many places, many points of his argument. But then we have Sarah. Who is Sarah? His wife. His wife. <laughs> And we have another woman by the name of Hagar. Now, who's Hagar? She was a slave. 
Sarah's hand baby. Oh, that was, that was the one that had the baby. Okay. Then we're going to have some children born into all of this. What are the children's names? Now, how in the world did all of this even come into being and turn into the big problem that Paul's even addressing at this particular point? Well, Sarah got impatient. Sarah was being impatient. Let's add that here. She was impatient because, well, she thought it was utterly ridiculous to think that she and Abraham together would have a son especially being so well advanced in years and the fact that she had been childless thus far. And in typical human fashion, when we don't understand what God is saying, we don't like what God is saying, we fix it. or we want to hurry up and make something happen, we try to fix the problem. That's what Sarah came up with. She came up with a game plan. This promise has been given to Abraham. He's going to be the father of a great nation, but I'm too old to bear a child. I've been childless thus far, so let's help out the process. This is the story of Genesis chapter 16. I have a handmaiden, a servant girl, a slave. She's young enough to bear children. So I tell you what, I'm going to make a deal. I'm going to let you, Abraham, engage in sexual relations with my servant girl in order that she might have a child on my behalf. I mean, we think about it in our world today. There are people who act as surrogate mothers for children when the woman can't, for various reasons, produce children of her own. Slaves couldn't own anything either, could they? But back then, you're right. Slaves essentially were property to whomever they worked for and lived with. So all of this, as strange as it seems, would have been totally acceptable in that world of that day and time. You're my servant girl. I have a need. You need to satisfy that need. Okay, I'm not going to argue with you, ma'am. Abraham has his fling with Hagar. She becomes pregnant. But it's not as simple and cut and dry as that. When we read Genesis chapter 16. Remember, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I thought you were wanting me to come over there. <laughs> Wasn't sure what was going on there for a moment. Woo. In chapter 16, the text tells us that upon her pregnancy, Hagar had some difficult feelings toward Sarah. You can't have children, but now your husband has impregnated me. There were some feelings of contempt toward Sarah. She wanted to change places or to Absolutely. With her. Well, it wasn't too much longer before Sarah begins to reciprocate those same hard feelings back toward Hagar. In fact, she vents her frustration in Genesis 16 back toward Abraham. Let's take a moment to flip over there. Genesis 16. I promise we're tying all of this together in Galatians in just a moment. In Genesis 16, this is what we read in verse 5 and following. Hagar is pregnant. Then Sarah said to Abram, May the wrong done to me be on you. I gave my slave girl to your embrace, and when she saw that she had conceived, she looked on me with contempt. May the Lord judge between you and me. 
But Abram said to Sarah, Your slave girl is in your power. Do to her as you please. Then Sarah dealt harshly with Hagar, and she ran away from her. This whole thing has been Sarah's plan. But now Hagar is with child, which is exactly what Sarah had wanted. Now Hagar, <laughs> I've got a child on the way and you don't. But Sarah's got a lot of bitter feelings. She's got some hard feelings because Hagar is showing contempt toward her. But guess what? She's going to take the brunt of her frustration out over here on Abraham. I gave you my servant girl. You went in. You had sexual intercourse with her. She's pregnant. Now leave her alone. She <laughs> has snapped. This is not a good time to be in Abraham and Sarah's tent. And it's so bad that the words that are used there, and it's interesting because it comes up again at other times in the Old Testament. And many times we use these words as a blessing to other people. I think the state woman's auxiliary may have it as a part of their official wording. When you're finishing up a meeting, may the Lord watch between me and thee while we're apart. Now, honestly, on the surface, that sounds totally innocent. May the Lord keep us safe. May the Lord supply our needs. May the Lord be a blessing to each of us until we see each other again. Often that's what happens when we read the text. That's not a bad thing, but also it's not exactly true to what's in the Hebrew text either because to say, may the Lord judge or watch between me and thee, is to essentially say, I don't trust you. May the Lord watch my backside. May the Lord watch your backside. And may we not do anything to try to one-up the other while we're apart. It's not really the benediction or the blessing that we typically think of it as. And that's what Abraham and Sarah, they're going back and forth. I imagine Sarah's just giving it to him and Abraham's standing in the corner with his arms crossed. Uh-huh. Yeah, okay. Gotcha. Well, she's your servant, girl, so do with her as you please. You came up with the idea... She's pregnant. Now you don't like the idea that she's pregnant. Send her away if you want to. And that's what she does. She deals harshly with Hagar, and off goes the servant girl. While she's away, she hears a word from the Lord telling her that she will give birth to a child, a son specifically. His name is going to be Ishmael, and he in his own right is going to have a line, a lineage of his own. He's going to be known throughout history, but it's going to be a very different line of history. It's a word that's very common in our culture today. Islam, the Muslim faith as we know it, their history, their line, their lineage goes back to Abraham, but not through Isaac, but through Ishmael. Some time passes, things cool down, Hagar comes back. Let's pick up over in Genesis chapter 21. Genesis chapter 21, beginning at verse 8. 
at this point, Isaac has been born. So you have big kid, little kid. And as often happens in families when there are siblings and one's older than the other, there could be a tendency for one to gang up on the other or multiple ones to gang up on another. And that's what's going on at this point in the story. In verse 8 it says, The child grew, referring to Isaac, and was weaned, and Abraham made a great feast on the day that Isaac was weaned. But Sarah saw the son of Hagar the Egyptian, whom she had born to Abraham, playing with her son Isaac. So she said to Abraham, Cast out this slave woman with her son, for the son of this slave shall not inherit along with my son Isaac. To translate the wording there as playing really softens what's going on there. In fact, sometimes kids will say, oh, we were just clowning around. We're just fooling. We're just playing. No big deal. But what's going on there, the wording that's behind what's often translated that they were playing is not oh, they were having a good time, but rather that Ishmael was ganging up against Isaac. He's picking on him, we might say. This really backfired on Sarah. Absolutely. This is one of those cases of something backfiring, all because we get in a hurry, because we try to rush ahead of God's timing and God's purposes. It's a part of being human. Don't get me wrong. But imagine all of the problems that could be solved that are going on in our world today if this moment right here had never occurred. If Abraham and Sarah had both believed and not thought it utterly ridiculous that they couldn't have a child late in life, then certainly Hagar would have never even been in the story and the rest would be history. No Ishmael, no Islamic faith. Now, I'm not picking on the Islamic faith this morning. Don't get me wrong. But think about how much tension and friction that's in our world between religious groups because of this Sarah. act of disobedience, being in a hurry, whatever you want to call it. Hagar's got to go. Ishmael's got to go. And that's the end of their story as far as the scriptures go, as far as our Old Testament Bible is concerned. Now let's go back over to Galatians and figure out how all this stuff fits together with what Paul is writing to the Galatian Christians and how and why that should even be important to us all these years removed. I think there's a lot that we learn from the story of Abraham, Sarah, and Hagar. But what Paul does here is doesn't just tell you the story. He does something here that, as I read a moment ago, he calls allegory. Now believe it or not, what Paul is doing at this moment is not unusual for Jewish teachers of his day and time, even prior to the time of the Apostle Paul to take a text, an Old Testament story, and to use it as an illustration for something more, something bigger than what it's just telling as the story in and of itself. Kind of like a parable? Sort of. Parables are a little bit different because parables have one key point, one gotcha sort of moment. Yes, we do look at Jesus' parables, and sometimes we can make them allegorical when we try to make every little part and piece stand for something else. But a parable versus an allegory makes one key truth, one boom gotcha sort of point. 
allegory, yes, it does things that are symbolic, but in allegory, your people, your places, your events are symbolic of something else. Let me give you a good illustration. I put it there in your handout. One of the best known allegories in Christianity is a book called Pilgrim's Progress. I remember reading this when I was in the third or fourth grade and I had no clue what was going on. It seemed like a story about a guy named Pilgrim who was traveling along, running into all kinds of unusual people, and he was trying to get to the celestial city. It was good literature, it was fine reading. Well, when eighth grade came around, guess what I had to read? I had to read Pilgrim's Progress again. But this time I was in middle school, 13, 14 years old. By then, I had matured. My mind had grown. And of course, I had a lot of other English classes between fourth grade and eighth grade to help me understand what an allegory is. An allegory tells a story, but everything in the story represents something else. So let me give you the example from Pilgrim's Progress. Pilgrim's Progress is not just a story written by John about some guy named Pilgrim. Pilgrim is a character who represents all of us as we're trying to find Christ. And what the story tells us is that Pilgrim is carrying a heavy burden with him. And of course, when you're a little kid, you're thinking, oh, he's got a backpack on, why doesn't he just take it off? But then in the eighth grade, I came to understand, you know what? That burden he's carrying around is not a book bag that he can simply take off, but his burden is the cares of life, the search for meaning, realizing that life is empty and unfulfilled and everything that you've been trying to do to satisfy your life has come up empty. And as the story unfolds, you finally get to a point where Pilgrim loses the burden. He comes to Christ, he professes, experiences salvation, then Pilgrim's name is changed from Pilgrim, this guy wandering around, to Christian. Someone who has now experienced Christ and is now on a journey toward the celestial city, which in the book represents heaven. Now there are a lot of people that Pilgrim and then Christian run into along the journey. And they have all kinds of funny names, and they do all kinds of things to try to lure the main character of the book off of the straight and narrow path, to distract him. And so I think you can see sort of kind of what I'm looking at. It's a story of the average person's life before Jesus, and then once they accept Jesus into their hearts. It's called an allegory. And of course, in a more modern, slightly more modern, although it's been around for many years now, the writings of C.S. Lewis, the Chronicles of Narnia, the Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe, the Last Battle. Stories that make for good reading, but when you think about them as being allegories or symbolic of how our lives unfold as Christians, you see that there are a lot of different things. This character represents this. In The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe, the main character is the lion by the name of Aslan. Well, who is Aslan? The character represents not just a lion that befriends a bunch of kids, but Aslan is a symbol of God. Paul uses that same way of thinking about storytelling, except he takes an actual story and connects symbolism with it. Let's go back to Sarah and Hagar. 
We might call this covenant one and covenant two. A couple of things that Paul says that are beneficial is that one woman, although he doesn't call her by name, is a symbol of freedom. The other is a symbol of slavery. And he says quite often, the flesh. Sarah, this one covenant, this one woman, represents not flesh, but the promise that was given to Abraham from the beginning. In a nutshell, what Paul is trying to do is use an Old Testament story to drive home the truth that he's wanting the Galatian believers to understand. If they follow the way of the flesh, the path of circumcision, it's as though they're trying to follow the way of Hagar. Hagar wasn't the true wife of Abraham. She was the servant girl. Had no rights. Absolutely, no rights. That was not how God wanted it. God didn't say when he issued the promise, Abraham, go talk to your wife Sarah. Tell her that you need to borrow one of her handmaidens. You'll have sex with her. You'll produce a child, and the promise will continue. And that was not a part of the game plan from the beginning. The promise was to Abraham and his legal wife Sarah that you all are going to have a child and that you're going to be the father of a great nation. You're going to have a multitude of descendants far greater than the stars of the heavens and the grains of sand along the beaches. Never said anything about pulling in this slave girl to help out the process. But here Paul is saying that those teachers who have come into Galatia who are insisting that you need to follow the law and that you need to be circumcised to fully experience God's salvation through Jesus are kind of like Hagar in the story. Hagar was a part of the story, but eventually she was dismissed. She was on the stage for a time, and then her character was kind of written out, like we would say in a TV show or a movie series. It sounded like to me Sarah was staying busy all the time. <laughs> Either she's having a child or she's trying to make preparations for somebody else to have a child for. And then she's fussing at Abraham because Abraham did exactly what his wife told him to do. Yeah. Go figure. It, it, is, it is confusing. Why the, you're, wait a minute, you're the one. But it happens in our lives too. That's when you just say as a man, yes, dear. You're right, dear. I'm sorry, dear. I can say it because I am one, so I know how it is. If it's red, then it's really white. Yes, dear. It, we'll, we'll do that. <laughs> it's written, Paul says, that Abraham had two sons. Of course, the son of the promise, the one through which the line, the lineage of God's salvation is going to come, is going to be Isaac. Isaac's going to have Jacob and Esau. Esau's going to go on to become the father of the Edomite people who would eventually be enemies of God's people. But Isaac, through Jacob, and then the 12 tribes of Israel, and as all that begins to unfold, we end up getting to Jesus. Yes, the Son of God, but also the Son of a human woman through the line, the lineage of David, as we're getting ready to celebrate, as we gear up for Advent here in the next couple of weeks. This is the covenant that Paul is telling the Galatians, you need to live according to this. This was God's intention in the beginning. Not all of this other complicated stuff that's happened. If you want to be free, if you don't want to be enslaved to something, then you need to follow the way of Christ. 
because over here is asking for trouble. It's adding a whole lot of additional stuff to the good news concerning Jesus that is not applicable to your new life in Christ. Thoughts at this point? Questions, comments? Uh, now Jesus' lineage to Abraham comes through the mother, right? Do what? Say that again. Jesus' lineage to Abraham through his mother, right? No. It's going to be through Abraham. For the Wait, father. Okay. All right. Abraham impregnates Sarah okay. for the birth but of I'm Isaac. Jesus Mary. Oh. Comes through. Oh, absolutely. Okay. It goes back to the line of David. So where I'm getting at, I didn't know that a lot of times it seemed like the men always were predominant, like you didn't ever really say anything about the women's mm -hmm. lineage or anything. Mm -hmm. It was always the man's lineage always went back to Abraham didn't really say anything about the women or the girls mm -hmm. having any. That's in the day when men ruled. That's it. <laughs> I'm going to chase a rabbit. I'm glad you brought it up. It's sort of the... <laughs> <laughs> this is your pre-Advent lesson. If you read these two books, specifically Matthew and Luke for the birth stories of Jesus. You find that Matthew's version is predominantly about Joseph. You're engaged to Mary. She's with child. This thing is from God. Don't be afraid. We get the wise men in Matthew. But one thing that's really unique about Matthew's gospel is when you look at the genealogy. And I know we hate reading genealogies in the Bible, let's be honest. Mm -hmm. But I encourage you to go back sometime, especially as we're moving into Advent and closer to Christmas, and read the genealogies in these two books. Because when you look at Matthew's version, That genealogy is going to go all the way back to Abraham. We often say that Matthew's gospel is the most Jewish of the four gospels. In his telling the story of Jesus, it's important for Matthew to convey Jesus having been the fulfillment of the promise given to Abraham way back when the origin of the Jewish people. But then there's Luke's story. Luke's story is very Gentile focused. Written probably to a predominantly large group of Greek or Gentile background Christians because so many of the things that happen in Luke's story, women take prominent roles in the stories. A Samaritan in one of the parables is the hero that takes care of the man who's been beaten. The most unlikely people are key people in the kingdom of God according to Luke's gospel. But to prove that Christ came for all of us, this line and lineage of Jesus, when we look at that genealogy in Luke, doesn't stop here at Abraham, the father of the Jewish people, but let's go all the way back to Adam, father of humanity. Mm -hmm. Jesus is for the Jews. Jesus is also for everybody has nothing to do with Galatians, but I just thought that was kind of interesting. I wanted to, to chase that rabbit. But we can tie it back in because Abraham is the patriarch, the father of the Jewish people. They hold him up as being their hero. 
Probably second to Abraham would be Moses because the law was handed down to Moses. He passed that along to the people. People started following the law and began living what we know as the Jewish faith. Paul says some interesting things here. He doesn't just say, okay, these are the two women. He also says some other things. One that he mentions is in verse 24. It says, now this is the allegory. One woman, in fact, is Hagar from Mount Sinai, bearing children for slavery. Now, it was not uncommon for the slaves of those times, especially Abraham and following the time of Abraham, to come from what we would know as modern-day Arabia. And in modern-day Arabia, that's where Mount Sinai is located. And because Mount Sinai was so connected to the giving of the law, and that's something that Paul is trying to argue against, is salvation through the law, he goes as far as connecting Hagar with Mount Sinai. But he goes a little bit farther. Doesn't stop there and say, oh, she represents Mount Sinai, which we could say is representing the giving of the law. She also represents the city of Jerusalem. Jerusalem is the hub of the Jewish faith. It's the city of David, Mount Zion, the temple. Everything Jewish revolved around the city of Jerusalem. And a lot of the issues that the Galatian Christians are dealing with are because of people who have been sent from Jerusalem. Remember the delegation that had come from James and spied on things and noticed that Peter was eating with Gentiles and next thing you know he's pulling away and Barnabas has fallen into the hypocrisy as well. That's a pretty strong way to say that the law and the city that's so sacred and holy to everything Jewish were represented by Hagar. But then what he comes over here and says of Sarah is the Jerusalem above. The true Jerusalem. Not a city of brick and mortar here on earth that represents the Jewish faith, but that city that awaits all of us when we depart from this life because we have that saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. This is the covenant that Paul is all for. But if they start to fall into being circumcised, observing feasts and and all this other stuff in addition to Jesus. This is what they're really becoming. We might say that they're becoming outsiders looking in, not the true people that God has intended for them to be since he called Abraham in the very beginning. To go back and reiterate the last part of what I read this morning, in verse 28 it says, Now you, my friends, are children of the promise like Ishmael? No. You're children of the promise like Isaac. And in verse 29 it says, Just as at that time the child who was born according to the flesh persecuted the child who was born according to the promise, so it is now also. 
Now, we're not talking in this moment about systematic persecution from the Romans against Christianity. We're talking at this moment about the friction that's starting to form between the Jewish community and the Christian community. Just as I shared with you from Genesis 21 that there was a time when Ishmael was picking on Isaac and therefore Hagar and Ishmael were sent away. Well, he was older. He was a little bit older. I don't really know how much older, but there definitely was. I think my, my translation says 16 years. Could have been. I mean, I mean it, it was enough that there was some bad blood, hard feelings. Yeah, because he had been king of the household. Sibling rivalry. Getting all the Jealousy. Love and then all of a sudden, here's this new baby. And now all of a sudden, they're being pushed off the scene. Mm -hmm. What needed anymore. Just as Ishmael had persecuted or picked on Isaac early on, it's what's happening when these Jewish teachers have come into Galatia and are upsetting and unsettling everything that Paul has tried to do in proclaiming Jesus to them. I don't know if it's 16 years, but it says for 16 years Abraham thought that Ishmael's birth had fulfilled God's promise. So I don't know if it's, it might be wrong. Mm -hmm. Other thoughts or comments? This, this is some complex stuff. Diane? I'm trying to understand that this is just a little bit deep for okay. me to understand. I mean, I it's, 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 we're I mean, all right there. I mean, it's all good, but it's sort of, <laughs> whew. Yeah. The thing is, I guess, when you're talking about this, and you know, we were talking about Sarah couldn't see a while ago. Sarah had sent Hagar because she knew that she wanted a baby. And it's like, why didn't she give her the baby for her to take care of? Right. You have the baby, and then you relinquish the baby to me. That's where that contempt comes in, I believe, in chapter 16, when it says that she had contempt for her mistress. She had some hard feelings back toward her because I've got a child, and who knows, maybe that had been discussed and now it's like no no this is my baby I'm not giving up my baby kind of like Moses, you know, the gave him up, you know. but still ended up being able to raise him yeah I mean because she would prove still been there taking care of her to sleep mm -hmm. so like Sarah never could love that baby don't you think in a sense it was blackmail it is and really honestly and I'm going to say it it may sound a little bit strong <laughs> it's only about a half step removed from what we would call rape Oh, Lord. And, and, and I mean, really, you think when Isaac was born, she was 90, whatever. I didn't take care of a child nowadays at my age, but it's living 90 years old. I mean, hey, it's tough at 42 say, taking care of a seven year old. I always say you must have some good handmaids or something because I can't see a woman 90 years old won't change diapers. And, that, that's and like 30 now, probably. Because you know Ooh. they used to live so much longer. It's. Uh, <laughs> other thoughts, other comments, questions. It's, it's heavy it stuff. It. <laughs> it's complicated stuff. Wow. <laughs> all that I can say, it seemed like a busy thing. Which it all gets back to the same thing I said the other week. You know, we've always done it that way. That's the first thing you know. A lot of times in a lot of your old churches, not your new churches, like we've always done it that way. You know, it's hard to change. And I'm really once you're in, set. It's comfort in that. You know, and, and I mean, even in my age, I don't like computers. I don't like cell phones. But <laughs> you know, it's sort of a we have to have them, live with them, or live without them, sort That's of. It. Mm -hmm. One point that I want to bring up, and I'll kind of wrap up with this. You notice where I began. Yes, I read Galatians chapter 4, 21 to 31 to you. But what did I do very quickly? 
We went back to the book of Genesis, didn't we? Yes, yes. There are a lot of people who say, oh, well, we just need the New Testament. Give me the four Gospels, maybe the book of Acts, bits and pieces of the Apostle Paul. That's all we need. And that's been a tendency within the early history of Christianity. Throw out the Old Testament, keep the New Testament. But honestly, unless you have the Old Testament, there are many things about the New Testament that you can't even figure out what in the world is being talked about until you go back to the original story. Before we could really appreciate what Paul is trying to say about two covenants and two women representing two covenants, we needed to consider some of the story and what that meant originally in its context, as we found in Genesis chapter 16 and 21. Exactly. I think that's one of the things when I read the Bible through the year um, a few years ago, it's like, it just puts it all together. It just it's amazing that everybody needs to read it from the Old Testament to the New Testament. It makes you understand it so much more. Mm -hmm. yeah, I mean, it makes you appreciate this book, and it makes you love it. Absolutely. There, there's a lot about Galatians in general, not just this particular story about Sagar and Hagar and Sarah. But a lot of the things, the image that he's using about you know, sacrifices and circumcision, this past Sunday when I was preaching from Hebrews chapter 10, being able to appreciate the Old Testament sacrificial system and the priest who would go in on the Day of Atonement and offer that sacrifice in the Holy of Holies and then the frequent burnt offerings that took place in the outer courtyard of the tabernacle. Unless you really understand some of the Jewish background of the New Testament, you can be looking at the New Testament like, what in the world is all this stuff even saying? Where's all this stuff coming from? Is it just something somebody's making up? But you find that a lot of Hebrews points back to the Old Testament. A lot of the things we're looking at in Galatians points back to the Old Testament as well. Hmm. Yes? I ain't trying to throw a monkey wrench in you, but uh, I, we don't question God. But I was just wondering, like, wonder, you know, instead of having all, you know, they had to sacrifice with the burnt offering and stuff. Why did, I wonder why God didn't just send Jesus way, way back down before we got all into the mess that we got into. Well, I mean, try to throw it. <laughs> Curveball this I think it goes back to Adam and Eve. He tried with Adam and Eve. Yeah. Then he really he tried to start again with Noah. Yeah, Noah. Noah gets off the boat. Next thing you know, he's drunk and his son looks upon his nakedness. We've got sin still in the world. Getting drunk, being naked, being embarrassed by your son. World's not a perfect place, and Noah's not the answer to God's problem either. And it's like, well, I'm going to create a people. A people I can love, a people who can worship me and show reverence and respect for me. And I think it's also a matter of progression in time, the fact that God doesn't. That God doesn't operate that quickly. And the fact that you've got a lot of history, a lot of experience, a lot of stories that we've come to know and love and have helped grow our faith that if, okay, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth and the next day Jesus died, end of the story, think about how much we would miss out on if we didn't have these other stories to mold and shape our faith today. Well, all God did was good. It's not God that messed up. And to start with, this plan did work. Abraham, the law, the sacrificial system, it was sort of a to get by with until we get to Jesus. Jesus. May have nothing to do with what you asked. But <laughs> <laughs> it's a good explanation. It, it is. It's a good explanation. Well, thank you all for being here this morning. I know our time is up, but I'm always glad to be with you all. I'm glad we were able to get through this challenging text and this challenging chapter now. But as I said a couple of weeks ago, with chapters 5 and 6, we get into some of the practical 
the nuts and bolts, the daily doing, the daily practicing of our faith, because there's a lot there about what it means to live according to Christian freedom, the freedom that God has given us through his son Jesus. We talk about the fruit of the Spirit, and we talk about what it means to shoulder one another's burdens, what it means to be in a community of faith, and, and to live this faith together, not just in isolation as individuals, but doing our faith together and how that nurtures and grows all of us for the better and closer to Christ. Thank you all also for viewing via the stream today or in the days to come, and I ask God's blessings to be upon you all as well. As we finish up this morning, may we bow for a moment of prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for the lesson that Paul has for us at this portion of Galatians. Lord, it's some tough stuff. It's some challenging material to think about an Old Testament story that we know, but then thinking about it in a symbolic way in the form of allegory. Lord, even when we don't understand, I ask, Lord, that you would help our misunderstanding Lord, that you would view us as a people who are trying to make sense of our faith, trying to nurture and grow it day by day. And Lord, even when something is challenging, may we not give up and be too discouraged, but keep pressing forward, keep becoming the people that you've called us to be as a community of faith. Be with my brothers and sisters now as we depart to go our separate ways. Give us traveling mercies and bring us back, Father, at your appointed time. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. Go in the peace of Christ.